Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to this webinar. My name is Byron Noble, and I'll be your organizer for the session. And with me today is Patrick Gordon. I have a short video I'd like to play just before handing over to our presenter. With the current state of electricity supply in our country, combined with the rising prices consumers face, you can be part of the solution by helping your clients switch to solar. Complete the articulated SANS 1010 Domestic Solar Water Heating Systems course to become an accredited installer. In celebration of Heritage Month, Articulated offers a 10% discount, making now the best time for you to make the switch. The discount is only valid until the 2nd of October, and that's it from my side, and I'd like to know it's our presenter. Okay, guys, let me just quickly share the screen. Okay, there we go. Most of, most of you guys will have come across the wording reduced pressure zone backflow preventers or RPZ valve, but I don't think many of us have actually been physically involved in installing them or selling them. So why the big hype about RPZ valves at the moment? The guys from Cape Town will have come across this much more because a couple of years ago when they were getting close to day zero of not having any water, municipalities there realized that they had to enforce this law of RPZs to protect their water supply. And I'm saying now that the municipality decided to enforce it because this law in SANS 10252.1 has actually been in there since 1996, but nobody's enforced it. So, yes, Cape Town now started enforcing it a couple of years ago. And the fact that we are all in South Africa fast approaching a time period where there will not be enough water for all of us. The prediction is that 2025, there will not be enough water for everybody in South Africa. So it's up to us to now start making sure to protect this water. And yes, when you are doing a new installation, it is law that you have to include a RPZ valve. But do all installations need a RPZ valve? So we're going to have a look at SANS 10252.1, which is your water supply to the houses and any installation to see what it actually says there for us on that. So... If we have a look at the first one is 0.5414 in 10252, where it says any reduced pressure zone backflow preventer that complies with the appropriate requirements of SANS 1808.15 is acceptable. So there is actually a law that says which SANS code it must comply to. Now, at the moment in South Africa, SABS cannot test they're busy setting up so maybe by the end of the year they'll be up and running but in the meantime all those codes at the bottom that you see there are the ones that are as it says acceptable because SANS 1808.15 has been aligned to the EU standards which are applied in all these cases there and if we have a look at 7.4 where it talks about the preservation of water and water quality. It says adequate measures shall be taken. So it's not one of those laws that it's a good plumbing practice or anything like that. It says adequate measures shall be taken to prevent deterioration of the quality of the water in any water installation. Then it carries on and it tells us now how we're going to protect it. And 74.3 actually mentions that it says adequate measures shall be taken to prevent back siphonage of water into the following. And it goes through a whole list. And the one that I want to draw your attention to is, yeah, in the middle where it says, in any installation, in all cases, where the design of a terminal fitting installed, including any hose, bibcock, lab tap, or movable shower units is such that a hose or any other flexible pipe can be attached to it. I'm sure you guys will agree to me that there is no home installation where there isn't some form of tap or fitting where a hose can be attached to, either it being a garden tap or a hand shower 
or anything like that. We've all got washing machines that are connected with a hose to the system. Then it carries on an underground irrigation system and any other fitting that can provide contact between polluted water and water within the installation. So what is viewed as polluted water? Well, polluted water is anything of which the color, taste and temperature has been changed. So once again, all our installations at home comply to at least the one where the temperature has changed because we all have geysers that are heating the water. Then it carries on that, and it says to prevent the possibility of backflow of water in any water installation, there are two things that we can use. It says either a double check valve or a reduced pressure zone backflow preventer. So there are two things. But if we carry on looking at the rest of the legislation, it will become very clear that the only one that you can actually use is the RPZ valve. Because it says here, any backflow prevention device shall be installed in such a position, okay, where it can be inspected. So it must be visible where you can actually see the valve. And the condition of backflow in the pipe in which the device is installed can be readily detected. Now, that's the first one that excludes a double check valve. Because there, if the non-return valve in there fails, you cannot see it. The RPZ valve, as you can see on the picture in front of you, has got the port at the bottom as a discharge port, so that if any backflow occurs, you will see it there. It is visible. Then it carries on. It is readily accessible for removal for the purposes of servicing, repair, or replacement without alteration to the water installation or to the structure which within the device is situated. So you will see that this RPZ valve comes with cap and linings. So you can just loosen it and slip the valve out and put another one in to replace it there. So that has to be kept. You cannot take the cap and linings off and then connect directly onto the valve. Now, most municipalities over and above that require that the valve on a yearly basis is inspected and tested to make sure that it's still working properly. And every five years, it must be overhauled or replaced. And a record must be keep of, kept of all these servicings and replacements. So it's not just, I'm going to go and do it. Nobody's got any proof whether it was or wasn't done. You actually have to, when you install it, put it onto a register Give it to the homeowner and show what you did, when you did it, and why you did it. Then it also says where it cannot be flooded by water or any other liquid. So you cannot install this at a basement level, for instance, because a basement of a building can be flooded, and then it can pull back any of that water. So the, the requirements are such, as you can see, that only... The RPZ valve with cap and lining fittings can and may be used. Then just to have a look and see where this RPZ valve should be. And this picture is now from the recommend recommendations from Department of Water and Sanitation, where it will show you point number one there is your RPZ valve. So it's just within the boundary line of the property before anything gets taken off. So it's before anything, whether it be garden taps or anything like that. So it's not like a pressure reducing valve that is after any hydro off areas. This one is directly right in the beginning. Nothing comes off between it and the water meter. And you will notice also that if you are using any alternative water source, like for instance, in this case, grey water, you can flush a toilet with that, but then the toilet is not allowed to be connected to the mains supply at all. So it must be a completely split system. Now you can ask, now why then if my one system cannot come in contact with the other one, why do they want me to put an RPZ valve in? Because when we do the installation, we're going to do it correctly. But we don't know when a plumber or someone 
that doesn't know the system comes in later may connect in to the wrong pipe and then we can get this dirty water back into our normal potable water supply. The next one we can see is very similar for the rainwater system. Also, once again, the RPZ valve right in the beginning before anything splits off. And the same goes if we're using groundwater for borehole pumps or anything like that. Then also, we should be putting up a sign at any outlet from these alternative water supplies to show that it is not drinking water. Now, you may say, but my borehole gives better water quality than what the municipality does, so why can't I use that? The fact is, you are not testing your borehole regularly to the SANS requirement that classifies it as good potable water. Unless you're doing that, you cannot interconnect it to the normal potable water supply from the municipality. And there should be signage up that it is not for drinking water. You may yourself decide you want to drink it and you want to take the chance, but you've got to protect anybody else coming onto your property that may use that water for anything but irrigation and so forth, but they are protected and they are warned of the fact that they shouldn't be using that. Then we have a look at the RPZ valve itself. If we have a look at your SANS legislation and so forth, where it says it should be installed, as we said, any discharge must be visible. So this black section where the water is discharged, it's like a tundish, so it's got a little window in there where you can actually see water dripping down, but you would be able to see it dripping out the bottom of that. But some instances, somebody wants to make sure the water isn't discharging there. It may be discharging a little bit further away. So that has got place underneath where you can connect a 40 or a 50 more pipe to it. But then the end of that pipe, wherever it's discharging, must still be visible to anybody that walks past. Another objection that people has is that it's a big chunk of brass that sits there and it is, especially in our conditions today in South Africa, susceptible to theft. So how do I prevent this thing from being stolen? You can put it in a chamber. Well, when I say in a chamber, you can protect it with a box or whatever over it, but then that discharge must be taken to just outside the surround that you're putting around it so that any discharge is still visible. Part of the installation also, again, is two isolating valves, one on the inlet, one on the outlet side, so that you can isolate it if you need to do any work, doing servicing or maintenance on that valve. And very important also is on the incoming side is to have a strainer. With any non-return valve, wherever we use it, the death of it is dirt in the system. As soon as dirt sits on the seat, it cannot close properly and it's going to leak and then we're going to waste water. So it's very important to have a strainer put in there. And you'll see that the strainer, the Y section of the strainer is actually pointing down. So don't point the strainer up or sideways or anything. It must be pointed down. That's the correct way of installing a strainer so that when you open it to clean it, any dirt will fall down to the bottom and not back into the pipe system. So make sure your strainer is installed correctly. These RPZ valves up to 50 mil or 65 actually are threaded with BSB threads on them. From the bigger size, as you'll see in the other little picture, they are flanged. So once again, it is removable without any change to the pipe system. You just undo your bolt, slide it out, and obviously put another one in. Even your bigger ones, you would have to have the two isolating valves and a strainer inside there. On the top of the valve, RPZ valve, you'll see there are three test ports. You don't have to have a gauge permanently attached to that. You can have a gauge on when you are busy testing it to make sure the first port is connected to your inlet pressure so that you can read and see what your mains pressure is at. 
The second one, which is sort of hiding in the back on this picture, checks any pressure onto your central port, which is your reduced pressure zone port. And the other one is your downstream pressure after the last non-return valve. And yes, I say last non-return valve because there are actually two check valves inside this, one on the inlet side and one on the outlet side. If for any reason your municipal mains pressure drops, you are going to get some discharge in that central port or out of the discharge port because it's just emptying that chamber so that any backflow will be visible then as a little stream or a drip or so forth afterwards. So there is a good fault finding system for these. I'm not going to go into it now. It is going to be too lengthy to actually sit and discuss this. We will discuss it on one of the follow-up uh, tech talks. If somebody is installing these, I would recommend giving us a call so that we can actually go through and do the training on these before you actually start doing the job. Another very important thing is you'll see the picture shows it in a horizontal position. It is only allowed to be installed in a horizontal position like that. You cannot have it inclined or vertically. So make sure that where you're putting it, there's sufficient space for the pipe to come out of the ground line up horizontally with the RPZ valve installation and then drop down afterwards again. And that is briefly the introduction to RPZ valves and how it fits in with our local legislation at the moment, SANS 1025 2.1. And the one that we have to look at there is 2018. So, yes, it has been there for four years. Over and above the fact that it came in in 96, we've actually, the latest issue has been there for the last four years already. Byron, I'm not sure if we have any questions that has come through in the meantime. Uh, there currently aren't any questions. <clears throat> okay, so we've got the little evaluation afterwards. That'll pop up. Once we now finished with the uh, tech talk, am I correct, Byron? Uh, yes. So if you're finished now, then um, we'll basically end off the, the webinar now. Okay. Yes. If there are no questions, I've got nothing further to say at the moment. So, yes, we can post the little review. Make sure that you do the assessment afterwards. Otherwise, you're not going to get your CPD points. Awesome. Thank you very much. Is there anything you would like to add, Steve? Yeah, morning. Uh, thanks, Patrick. I think, again, you know, as Brennan's always been saying, is looking at new opportunities. Uh, as you said, um, it's been around for a long time. We obviously, in terms of the plumbing fraternity, uh, we haven't picked up uh, in terms of uh, that add-on value. And obviously, with uh, the issues that we have with uh, water and water conditions throughout the country, that, um, again, an important part of, of uh, our trade. So I think it's something for the, the plumbers and those in attendance uh, to make contact and, and get the training. And uh, let's start getting it out there and making sure that we do our best to ensure the water quality that's being provided, et cetera, et cetera. Well done. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us this morning. Have a blessed week.